A Room of One's Own by Virginia Woolf It is a part of 20th century British literature and is a prose or fiction. Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own is a path-breaking essay of the 20th century thought. It explores the history of women in literature through an unconventional and highly provocative investigation of the social and material conditions required for the writing of literature. The characters in this fiction are Narrator Virginia Woolf calls her fictional narrator Mary Betton. She delivers her lecture on women and fiction through this fictional character. As Woolf's alter ego, the narrator expresses her thoughts, views, opinions through pity and incisive language and elegant metaphors. Judith Shakespeare, the fictional sister of William Shakespeare, the narrator imagines Judith's life of unrealized genius. Though just as brilliant as her brother, Judith is unable to fulfill her potential in her patriarchal Elizabethan society and eventually commits suicide. Carmichael, the fictional author of the imaginary novel Life's Adventure. The narrator views Carmichael as representative of the contemporary descendants of historic female writers. Mary Betton Mary Betton is Wolf's aunt whose name Wolf attributes to the narrator. Bequeathed the narrator 500 pounds a year upon her death. This inheritance allows the narrator to maintain her independence and help her express her talent. Mary Sutton a friend of the narrator of Women's College. Funham Mary Sutton's mother had 13 children. She and narrator discuss the history of women and money. The Manx Cat The narrator sees a Manx cat at the lawn at Oxbridge. It reminds her of the pre-war days in England when people seem to speak with more music in their voices. The cat without a tail may be a symbol of castration. Bidri, an Oxford security official who stops the narrator on the lawn at Oxbridge and informs her that only men are allowed to cross it and women must remain on the table path. Library, an elderly man who denies the narrator Entrance to the library. Mr. A, an imagined male author whose work is all overshadowed by looming self conscious and childish self assertiveness. Now, moving on to the summary of A Room of One's Own, written by Virginia Woolf. Virginia Woolf uses a fictional character, that is, narrator, whom she calls Mary Betton as her alter ego to express her thoughts on what women are like. The fiction women write, the fiction written about women, a combination of the three. A week ago, the narrator crosses a lane at the fictional organ Oxbridge University. The name Oxbridge is a combination of Cambridge and Oxford. Tries to enter library and passes by the chapel. At each stage, she is intercepted and reminded that women are not allowed to do such things without men accompanying them. She later talks with a friend of hers, Mary Sutton, about and how funds were raised with great difficulty for women's colleges and men's colleges found immediate and copious funding from willing and generous kings and wealthy men. The narrator and Sutton denounce their mothers and other women for being financially weak and hardly leaving anything for their daughters. The narrator then realizes the obstacles they faced. Child rearing and entrepreneurship are inimical to each other and only in the last 48 years have women been allowed to own the money they earn. Looking for answers, 
the narrator explores the British Museum in London. She discovers that are innumerable of books written on women by men while there are hardly any books by women on men. She selects a dozen books to try to find answer for why women are poor. Instead, she discovers a wide range of topics and a contradictory array of men's opinions on women. The male professor writes about the inferiority of women which angers her. She then feels that she has become angry because the professor has written angrily. Had he written dispassionately, she would have paid more attention to his hypothesis and not to him. She considers why men in India are so angry, though theirs is a patriarchal society which men enjoy absolute rights and powers and control over money. She opines that throughout history, women have served as models of inferiority that helps enhance the superiority of men. In this context, the narrator is grateful is for the inheritance left by her aunt, Mary Betty. The narrator investigates the status of women in Elizabethan England, puzzled why there were no women writers in the total literary age. She imagines that that would have happened had William Shakespeare had an equally gifted sister named Judith. She outlines the possible course of Shakespeare's life, schooling at a grammar school, marriage and work at a theatre in London. His sister, however, was not able to attend school and her family disgraced her independence time. She was married off against her will, while still in her teens and ran away to London. The men at the theatre denied her the opportunity to work or learn the craft. Impregnated by theatrical men, she committed suicide. The narrator argues that the difficulties of writing are severe for women who are actively discouraged. The writer, after a then, 17th century novelist, playwright, and poet whose works include the novel Odunoko and the play The Rover, marks a turning point. A middle class woman whose husband's death forced her to earn her living. Ben's triumph over circumstances surpassed even her excellent skill of writing. Ben is the first female writer to have freedom of mind. Innumerable middle class women writers of the 18th century and beyond are indebted to Ben's successful attempt at breaking the glass ceiling. The narrator analyzes a recent debut novel called Life's Adventure by Mary Carmichael. Viewing Carmichael as a descendant of the female writers, she has commented on the narrator's assets of his work. She finds the prose style uneven, perhaps a rebellion against the flowery reputation of women's writing. The narrator believes Carmichael has her work cut out for her in recording the lives of women and she will have to write without ransom against men. In a hundred years, the narrator believes Carmichael and many other women writes like her will be a better writers provided they have financial security and a room of their own. She asserts that Judith Shakespeare still lives within all women and that if women are provided the necessary ambience in the next century, she will be reborn. And coming to the themes of this fiction, the first is the importance of money. From the narrator's point of view, lack of financial stability prevents women from having room of one's own and thus being assured of monetary independence is of prime importance for meaningful literary output. Since women have independence traditionally been deprived of financial help, their creativity has been systematically stifled throughout. Women states intellectual freedom depends upon material things. 
Poetry depends upon intellectual freedom and women have always been poor. Not for 200 years merely, but from the beginning of time. Wolf uses this, her statement to explain why so many women have written successful poetry. Women have contained with frequent interruptions because they are so often deprived of a room of their own to write. The subjectivity of truth. Wolf argues that even history is subjective. What she seeks is nothing less than the essential oil of truth, but this eludes her and eventually concludes that no such thing exists. Wolf forces her reader to question the veracity of everything she has presented as truth so far, and yet she also tells them that the fictional parts of any story contain more essential truth than the factual parts. Next, Coleridge's androgynous mind. Wolf adapts romantic poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge's idea that the androgynous mind is a pure vessel for thought that inspires the most objective and creative relationship with reality. She reasons out that an androgynous mind like Shakespeare's is unconcerned with its owner's pretty grievances. It rises beyond and filters out its personality as its genius shines brightly upon the world. The aggression of men. In her metaphor of looking glass relationship, men threatened by the thought of losing their power belittle women to feel strong and invincible. Institutionalized sexism. Wolf states that only men were allowed to keep their own money and this helped them flow back the financial resources back into the universities and institutions helped them gain power in the first place. In contrast, the women's university, the narrator state had had to scrape together the necessary funds with great difficulty. The next and the last theme. Metaphorical concept of light. Wolf threads the concept throughout a room of one's own of light and beauty as a metaphor for genius. Next, the motives. Motives are interruptions and gender inequality. Interruptions. When the narrator is interrupted in a room of one's own, she generally fails to regain her original concentration, suggesting that women without Private spaces of their own, free of interruptions, are doomed to fail in their intellectual pursuits. And the last motive, gender inequality. Throughout the essay, the narrator emphasizes the fact that women are treated unequally in her society and that this is why they have produced less impressive works. And these are the characters, themes and motives. And also the major point of writing this fiction is, in the late October 1928, Wolf delivered a lecture on women and fiction at Newham and Britain, the two women's colleges at Cambridge, England. Wolf had written the lecture in May 1929 and she expanded it into a room of one's own and the essay was published in book form on October 24, 1929. A single most important work of feminist literary criticism, A Room of One's Own, explores the historical and contextual contingencies of literary achievement. Thanks for watching.